So he's like, oh no, I just gave away what's going to happen in six months. No, yeah. I was locking <laughs> two up for six months. So that's exactly what they did. Wait, really? I, just, I didn't oh, even hear the story. That's, that's exactly what <laughs> they did. What They're like, do. hey, bring your stuff on in. <laughs> Welcome to Talk With History. I am your host, Scott, here with my wife and historian, Jen. Hello. On this podcast, we give you insights to our history-inspired travels, YouTube channel journey, and examine history through deeper conversations with the curious, the explorers, and the history lovers out there. Today, we are joined by Sarah, better known as the History Chick 1941 on Instagram and YouTube. Welcome, Sarah. Thanks for having me on. All right. So before we get to chatting with Sarah and before I introduce her, um, I want to ask folks to give us a review wherever you're listening. The reviews truly help the show grow. And come on, the faster we grow, the faster we can catch the History Channel <laughs> as far as followers on all their social media stuff. So click the link in the show notes to subscribe for free on your platform of choice. Now, our guest tonight is Sarah, and she is the host of History Behind the Page series. And if you don't know this fantastic series yet, it's a live Instagram series where you get to know the people behind your favorite history pages, channels, movies, TV shows, books, and much more. If you enjoy this podcast, I can guarantee you will enjoy her live interview streams. And Sarah is now also posting these on YouTube. So thank you for joining us tonight, Sarah. How are you doing? I'm doing good. It's Friday. So I'm doing good. Good. It's Friday. So it's a good, it's good. (laughs) That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I, I understand if you have to, uh, to, to go help out the, the pup back there. Um, so, so just let us know, but Sarah, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? It's usually how I kind of like to open it up with guests is tell us a little bit about yourself, maybe where you're from and kind of how you kind of became to be so passionate about history. Yeah. So, um, I'm. Sarah, or the History Chick 1941. Um, I live in Oregon, so I'm from the Pacific Northwest. I'm a, a true Oregonian. I was born and bred here. I'm yeah. not a transplant. Yeah, there's lots <laughs> of transplants nowadays. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> lots of transplants. Yeah. Um, my love of history really started in eighth grade. Um, we were learning about the Civil War in mm-hmm. our social studies class, and we we're learning about it kind of interactively. So we actually played out the civil war chronologically. So we divided the class in the North and the South. And then I was designated as, as grant. (laughs) So we read what happened um, in the civil war uh, day by day and talked, uh, just learned a little bit about it. And then uh, we watched the movie glory in school at the end of it. And it was just actually perfect because at the time, I was really obsessed with Matthew Broderick and I was in the Matthew Broderick <laughs> fan club. And so when I, oh, that's awesome. when I saw, I was so excited. I was like, Oh, Matthew Broderick movie. And then when I saw Gloria, I just, you know, fell in love with it, fell yeah. in love with history. And, um, after the civil war, um, all the eighth graders, all the middle school or middle school, eighth graders, we did an event called, um, walk through history. Oh, cool. I don't think they do that in schools anymore, Yeah, but you picked a time in history and you dressed up in that time period. So whether it was, was, you were a soldier in world war two or like my, my sister was Betsy Ross. I dressed up as Scarlett O'Hara from gone with the wind Uh, and I did a presentation on the civil war. So I had her like costume of the green dress and each person had like their own booth. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Each each person had their own like booth. It was kind of like an expo. So you go to each booth and it was all dressed up in props and you would give the presentation oh how cool uh yeah it was super cool and I I don't think they do it anymore but it was such a fun event um and so that's kind of where my love of history started was learning about the the civil war in middle school and then in high school I had two really amazing history teachers uh Mr. Beeman and he was so interactive and very passionate about history. He made it fun to learn. And if you didn't understand something you were learning and you asked him to explain more, he would explain it in a different way and would make sure it would explain it until you understood it. And he, (laughs) at the end of each week, we had these things called celebrations of learning. They were quizzes, but he called them celebrations (laughs) of learning. So we'd come in at the end of the week and there'd be party hats on our desk. 
and celebrate good times would be playing and we yeah. would have to wear the party hat while we were taking the test <laughs> and kind of take the party hat <laughs> until until the test was until we turned in our quiz but yeah that's kind of where my love of history began was you know, oh, that's 20, 22 years ago so yeah that's that's super fun thank you for sharing that with us i mean that's really cool to hear like it sounds like like your class like your school essentially put on a science fair but for history yeah like history day it, you know it was pretty yeah mm-hmm. it was yeah that's 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 such a neat idea i don't think i've ever actually heard that before but yeah, that's but leave it to the pacific northwest to do things a little bit different a little bit more fun so <laughs> Um, so how did that eventually translate into you starting to do this live series? I've been in and out of, of history for a while. I um, After you know high school and stuff, I was working in mostly historical films with a local film company here doing okay. um, hair and special effects makeup. Cool. And I became friends with a bunch of other history nerds yeah. like me, collectors and, and historians and all this stuff. Um, I... I lost my passion for history for a while um, just because of life and stuff. And then when COVID hit, uh, I lost my job because of COVID uh, reduction in force. So my position was eliminated and I started to get back into history again. And then in on December 7th of last year, you know, the anniversary of of Pearl Harbor, I was, (laughs) I was sitting in my room and I was just like, I really want to make a history post, but every time I make history posts, like people roll their eyes and you know, I don't get it. Nobody likes it or whatever. And I want to share this. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to start an Instagram page. Yeah. And so I started, my first post was a a Pearl Harbor post on December 7th of last year. And then around February, I, wanted to do more. I started meeting all these really cool history people and I wanted to know their why Mm -hmm. I wanted to know how they got into history. I'm a very curious person. Sure, I love, especially in like movies and stuff. I love the behind the scenes or the making of and and all that stuff. And so I was curious about how a history lover, somebody else like myself, how, how did they get into history? how did they start a YouTube channel? How do they find their content and travel and all this stuff. So I was like, my curious little brain, I was like, I'm going to start a live series. Yeah. And so the first person, of course, who I just couldn't wait to interview was JD from the history underground. Yeah. And because yep. <laughs> yep. I've been following him for a while yeah. and I was so lucky that he said yes. And I was so ecstatic. And um, then it just kind of took, took off from there. I love hearing people's why and their yeah. passion. So No, that's, that's that's great. And it's been really cool for us, right, to see your, your, your followers, you know, grow, you grow on Instagram, Mm -hmm. right? I think we, Mm -hmm. I think we, I think we saw you when you were somewhere around five, six hundred, seven hundred, right? And you've grown significantly since then. Yeah, because I remember you had like the book giveaway when you hit a certain number. Oh yeah, yeah. I yeah. at two at two thousand followers, yeah. I did a a book, a book giveaway with Marcus uh, Brotherton's a signed copy of Marcus Brotherton's yeah. book. Yeah, yeah, so that was it's, awesome. It's been fun, kind of seeing seeing you do these live series, and I I can tell right, just like anything, the more repetitions you get, the little bit better that that you get at it. And, um, it's, it's just fun seeing other, other kind of fellow history fans who are doing stuff like this grow, you know, at at kind of what we're doing the same thing. Yeah. I think what Sarah does, is very unique and cool. She does, um, the reels, the kind of history jokes, (laughs) you know, with like the books or like explaining (laughs) history to someone. And I just love those so much. They're so entertaining. (laughs) Thank you. That's my, my little, my little nerdiness. I love That's when you can tell I'm on a, I'm on a lull of, (laughs) I need to distract myself from my history post. I'm like, I'm just going to do a silly, goofy post. Well, and then you (laughs) asked me to be a part of one. And I was so honored. You know, we did the, we did the thing from Hamilton. Um, That's right. You know, I have the Hamilton book right here, but yeah, we did the thing from Hamilton where we did the, Hey, you know, women, I, you know, not a lot of women. um, Mm -hmm. I I think there's more women than we know. Don't really share a lot about history or in the history field. It Mm -hmm. is the mostly male dominated field. So it's, it was, I wanted to feature awesome women who love history and share history and have a passion for it. So that reel kind of puffed in my head and I was like, I need to get Jen on this reel. Yeah. (laughs) It was so awesome. Thank you for asking me. Yeah. Well, so Sarah, one one of the, the next part we like to do is what I call a a history word association game. I'll say a word 
And usually people kind of just end off way off over here in right field. It's sometimes they just don't end up landing on history at all. But these words, while they may not sound historically oriented, I kind of tie them all together at the end. So this is just kind of a fun way for for podcast listeners to follow along, right? Word association game and for us to kind of broach a topic. So if I was to say G.I. Joe, what's the first thing you would think? The army. Okay. All right. If I was to say Cobra, what's the first thing you would think? Um, the Karate Kid. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Jen said. The same thing. I said Cobra Kai. He said Cobra. I said Cobra Kai. <laughs> strike first. Strike first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. That's good. That's okay. There's no wrong answers here. All right. Uh, if I was to say Neptune, what would you think? The ship. Okay. If I was to say Axis. What would you think? Enemy. Right. And then that that's all leading into World War II. So the first one, G.I. Joe, that, that term, actually, I was kind of trying to look up something that wasn't quite so obvious in the very beginning. But G.I. Joe kind of became a little bit more popularized during World War II. And then Cobra, that was actually, the I think it was an operation name for basically after the Normandy landing and that first mm-hmm. Normandy push. So that was actually, I looked it up. It was um, General Bradley, right? That was having kind of his campaign, his operation was Operation Cobra. And then Operation Neptune was the naval portion of the Normandy landing, which led in, Mm -hmm. yeah, I think it led into Overlord, Mm -hmm. right? And then the Axis powers in World War II. So that's just kind of a fun way for me to, one, kind of hear how people think. I was all over. Um, He's like G.I. Joe. I'm like, uh, great American hero. And then he's like, Neptune. I'm like, Mythology? Yeah. <laughs> <I was> like... <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so, so one of the reasons I like to kind of hone in on a particular topic is I, I like to ask, what do you remember learning about World War II when you were younger and maybe something more that stands out to you now, maybe your, your kind of favorite World War II history story or, you know, piece of piece of that era? Like what stands out to you learning about it when you were young and then something that might stand out now? So learning about it when I was young, it was, it was very basic school learning about World War II. Um, We really didn't learn anything about the Pacific theater. It was mostly the European theater. We learned Hitler came to power. um, He invaded Poland. We, uh, we got bombed by Pearl Harbor and then we came to the war. And then, um, you know, then towards the end, we learned about uh, the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. So, it really wasn't when I was much, much younger before I got into history, when we were learning about this, it wasn't, I didn't learn a lot about it, but learning about it as I especially got older and learning about how in depth world war two was, it's, it's crazy to me because also you have all of these different operations in school, we learned that it was pretty much the United States and Britain who were in World War II. There was yeah. nobody else involved. Mm-hmm. We were the victors. We were the only people that were in World War II. And so, you know, we thought that for a long time. And then realizing how many different uh, countries and allies we had in World War II, that's just like mind blowing. Russia. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, we were yeah, friends. Russia, <laughs> yeah. we, we, were, we, were, allies. we were friends. We were allies. We were allies. <laughs> yeah. But the thing with that is, I think Russia kind of looked at whose side should I be on? Yeah. Who mm-hmm. is going to yeah. get us farther? Yeah. Who's going to win the war? Yeah. And so that's who they sided with. So that's why they sided with us. They're like, Germany's going to lose. I'm going to side with the United States and just kind of go with their thing mm-hmm. because they were looking at the long picture sure. and, yeah. and the future. Um, that's just my, my opinion and some stuff that I've read, but, uh, interesting, interesting things that I've learned, um, that I think is just probably one of the most fascinating things is, uh, the deception tactics and just the whole deception tactics and that, um, you know, Hitler did think that we were going to invade pot of Calais, like, and even when the D-Day landings happened and he heard them happening, he still thought we were going to invade pot of Calais and it, that wasn't it at all and which is why he kept the panzer division up where it was supposed to be and if you know if he had sent in the panzer division when they requested it you know the d-day could have turned out much differently but uh yeah 
those those deception ta- tactics were just absolutely insane. I love how you love that, Sarah. And I think, you know, you love the ghost army. You always talking about the balloons that they yeah. used and like the deception <laughs> yeah. that they used. And, you know, I'm like, Sarah missed her calling in like Intel <laughs> because they still they, yeah. don't don't get me. Uh, they still do that today. Yeah. Governments still do that today. Armies yeah. still do that today. Believe me. And so it's very interesting yeah. that that's something that's very useful. And it's a tactic when you look at satellite pictures, you know, is that mm-hmm. real? Or are they just trying to deceive us? And um, maybe it has something to do with you being a makeup artist. You know, like, you know, like yeah. something that you're like, you're used to kind of making things like, well, how can I perceive it to, yeah. you know, look different or get in someone's mind to think different. But you, you're you buying the balloons all the time of the tanks and stuff. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Because well, that's basically just, I mean, what they had, yeah, right? They did right. big balloon they tanks were, and they were in, and... they were in inflatable tanks and um, it's it. You know, the ghost army was made up of artists mm-hmm. and engineers. They weren't made up of, mm-hmm. you know, G.I. Joe mm-hmm. yeah. combat soldiers, even though they, you know, they went through basic training sure. and, and had some, you know, had to learn combat and stuff. But they were artists and teachers yeah. and painters. And yeah, so maybe that's what th- maybe that's, that's what, what made up. Sure. Yeah, made up the ghost army. And they just these deception tactics of, you know, creating whole fake military encampments, uh, motor pools. They yeah. had ships like and then oh the sound the, the gigantic speakers that would do sound of soldiers footsteps and radio chatter and they created fake insignia and went to town and started getting all chummy with the town folk so yeah. that seeing you know so uh a spy was there they'd mm-hmm. be like oh no like this is one of Patton's you know army right and- it was great it was good yeah Yeah, i I think i'm it worked yeah i'm similar to you as far as like learning world war ii when i was young the the one thing that when i was thinking about this right i learned the basics same same as you just like you said the one thing i remember that stuck out to me probably in my high school years was the 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 military industry that came out of world war ii Mm -hmm. and like the american kind of industrial almost like another industrial age really for us, Sure, you know, Mm -hmm. for some reason that always just stands out in, in my head. And then all the, the surplus right type that that we had after the war. I think Um, the big thing people learn about world war two in high school and grade school is Nazi. Yeah. Right. I think not, it gets ingrained in our mind, right? The swastika and the Nazis Mm -hmm. bad. Yeah. And then you're watching movies, right? So any like, schindler's list or any movie of the time you're like it that's really ingrained that the enemy is nazi like it really you really don't think about japanese or italy right, right. it's just Not as nazi much. so yeah. and like you said so you really think of the european front you know it's very yeah. rare we talk about the pacific front right so yeah we, we probably i probably have studied the pacific front a little bit more just because the navy and you know a lot of navy yeah. education but i actually heard a very interesting story about um England and World War II just the other day. So just this last week, I was up in Newport, Rhode Island. There's some Navy stuff up there. And a friend of mine, you know, a co-worker of mine, he he worked for a strike group out here in the Norfolk area and volunteered to do some kind of joint work with the United Kingdom, right, with the UK. They were telling him a story. They told my friend Greg a story about a toy maker during World War II who was asked to make kind of like a scale size model of the coast of like all the the English coast in France and in the various coasts by by the the British government, right? By the army, by the navy. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this toy maker, he's he's making this kind of scale size model of the coast, and he assumed right is so that they could do their planning and this, that, and the other. And so this toy maker finishes it up whenever it is. It's late at night, but he's it's in a rush because everything you know back then they tried to, to try to do it now, now, now. So he had it in his in the back of his truck with either his someone who worked for him or his son or something like that driving up to the Portsmouth base and there's a midshipman so this is someone who's not even technically like a a full-blown naval officer yet so there's a midshipman it's in the middle of the night it's like midnight who's kind of standing gate guard and so they they stop him there and they're they're kind of looking they're like what are you bringing he's like oh I'm bringing this you know scale size model or whatever like that of the coast and they, they kind of look in the back you know, this midshipman so he's he's thinking he's like well we don't need the whole coast we just need normandy and then he realizes right then and there what he just said because normandy was in like six months 
So he's like, oh no, I just gave away what's going to happen in six months. <laughs> no, yeah. it's locking you up for six months. So that's exactly what they did. <laughs> really? I, just, I didn't oh hear the story. That's, that's exactly what <laughs> they that's did. What I they were like, do. hey, bring your stuff on in. And that guy didn't leave the base for six months until after Normandy. Yeah, exactly. You've seen too this, much. This is, it's, I, I, apparently, this is like a legit true story. I tried to look it up online earlier today mm-hmm. and I couldn't find it. So maybe this is one of those like kind of urban legends that's been passed down, you know, in the Navy or in the military over there. But I believe it. I believe it because I believe a midshipman I, would be that dumb. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But that's now that's a rabbit hole I'm going to be going. Through. I know I was trying I was trying to search it out. I'm going to talk to my friend again when I see him next week because I was thinking about that. But that, I talk about a crazy story, right, about it? World well, War I Two. Mean, and it, and, it, yeah. and, and to your point, right, into like all the deception and this, that and the other, that stuff was like really tightly controlled because it was so important at the time. And no one knew who yeah. the spies were. Right. The spies were so deeply embedded. Right. Both sides really feel um, pa- grounded in their cause, yeah. right? The Nazis yeah. feel very grounded in their cause. The British feel, and Americans feel. So the spies are deeply embedded, right? Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, you have to really be careful of who you're talking to. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of Francis Scott Key, though, right? Because that's what he does. He goes to that ship to get the guy, Dr. Beans, oh, yeah. free. And they're like, well, now you have to stay because we're bombing Baltimore tomorrow and you saw the plans. Yeah. So now so you got to so, stay. So they it. kept him there and yeah. that's when he got inspired to write yeah. this, the Star Spirit. So it's like, you've seen too much. Now you yeah. must stay. But yeah, I, he told me that story and I was just, I like, he told it, we were talking about it over dinner and he's like, oh, yeah, this is the story that they told us. And I guess it's apparently true, you know? Um, oh, that's crazy. Yeah. I that's, mean, that's, loose, that's loose, loose lips sink ships. That's yeah. So, you exactly. know, that was, you know, one of the best. It is. It is true. But yeah, it's it's just super fun. And I know World War Two. I mean, that's that's a that could be three podcasts like, in itself. I didn't hear anything. You know? I didn't hear. I didn't hear <laughs> yeah. what? I'm, I'm just a toy maker. Oh I God. didn't hear anything. I, you know, like, yeah. let, please let me go. But I, I guess he got stuck there for six months until oh. after the operation was over. Oh um, man. Yeah, pretty wild. So, so so moving on from that, because I'm sure we could talk World War Two history for for numerous episodes of this podcast. <laughs> um, but we like to move on to something that's uh, a little bit more te- more personal to you. Um, and it's we like to ask, like, what's the first big historical event you remember growing up? Like that first time where it's either something on the news or you actually remember being like, oh my gosh, like here's the bigger world out here or... I, you know, mm-hmm. for lack of a better word, I, I love what the Daily Bell Ringer he told us, you know, a, a couple months ago, you know, young kids tend to be just, for you know, lack of a better word, narcissistic, mm-hmm. right? They they think that it's just them in their bubble. And then there's that first time where you remember something, yeah, some major historical event could be local, could be national, global. But what's the what's kind of the first what you would think of as a historical event that you remember growing up? Uh, September 11th. Oh, really? Wow. Um, okay. Yeah, I was, um, th- it was, it was the first, I've, I've seen other historical events on the news growing up, but I was at the age, I was uh, 13 when 9-11 happened yeah. and we watched it live on television in school. I heard everything come over the radio and I didn't realize like the seriousness of it until we were watching it on TV and the towers falling on TV and realizing everything of you know of what just happened because before that i didn't we didn't know really what a terrorist attack was yeah yeah. we didn't you know even though there had been some that have happened prior to that you know in in other countries and stuff but we didn't know that Mm -hmm. and so it was the first time that it was the first historical event that i really grasped onto and changed the way that i thought and looked at the world i guess sure yeah. So that would probably that would that would be it. That's the one that sticks. And in you were my thirteen. Were you head. in school when it happened? And did the teachers like turn it, it went, on TV or how did it? How did you learn about it? Yeah. Everything? So it was a Tuesday. I remember what day it was. It was. Yeah. So I was actually getting I was getting ready for school and I had on Jam and ninety five point five our hip hop <laughs> radio station. Oh yeah. And and breaking news came on and they were like you know a plane has flown into the twin tower one of the twin towers. And I remember calling my best friend at the time and I'm on the phone. I'm, I'm 13. I'm 
putting on makeup and I'm like, oh my gosh, a pilot flew into a, a building. How did he not see the building? You know, like uh, I had yeah. no idea. Of course, you know, yeah. And, and yeah. all that stuff. And I and my dad came in my bedroom because he watched was watching the news in the morning and he said, get ready, I'm taking you to school. And he had the most... I've never seen that kind of look on his face, like kind of like a a ghostly look on his face. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay. And I remember the drive to school being very quiet. And then when we got to school, we had our like little pod classroom areas and all the teachers were standing out there and they had the TVs out and they had us all sit down. Um, We didn't even put our our backpacks or anything away in our lockers. And they explained, they go, we're going to have you watch what's happening um, and they explained everything. I'm getting a little bit of goosebumps right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they explained they explained everything. And they go, if you have questions, um, let us know. But this is really important. You guys need to watch it. And yeah. we just watched the news and watched everything happen on TV. And um, we got let home from school yeah. early that day. And then, um, well, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I'd say good for your school I for kind too. of really like saying like hey this is this is something that the con- you know this is a, this is a big thing right cuz 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 a lot cuz a lot of schools would just say hey schools canceled stay home we don't know what's going on yeah. right but but good for them for saying like hey we recognize that this is something that's that's serious and it's it's going to be a, a historical thing so let's yeah. sit here and let's let's talk about it right let's let's yeah let's be be together in this now have you and like, I mean, ever been to new york before that have you had, I, d- i've just never knew been it from york. like seeing it on tv with the t- i i like knew that. it from tv and at the time i really wanted to be a broadway actress so i was oh I had a, i had sure. posters and mm-hmm. all that on my wall so like but um yeah i mean the this i didn't know the seriousness of it until i saw miss slim and miss nomi who were my age you know, at the time, mm-hmm. uh, crying, watching this on television. And I think that's the moment I knew how serious this was. Yeah. And, um, yeah, but this, you know, yeah. Yeah. Nine yeah, 11. We've, we've talked about where we were, you were in the I Naval Academy. I was in the Naval Academy. I was three days away from getting my wings, my aviator wings. Yeah. I was, wow. I had just finished flight school. I was actually sleeping in cause I was done with flight school. My parents were coming in Mm-hmm. And my mom called me, woke me up, and she's like, turn on the take TV. And I was like, I just partied all night. like. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And, she, and she's like, a plane flew into the tower. And I'm like, what? And I'm like, was it like having engine problems? She's like, oh, we don't know because the time you didn't know, right? Yeah. And I'm talking to her on the phone, and all of a sudden I see the second plane fly into the tower. And I said, mom, I got to go. Yeah. And that's when the base started calling, and they're like, no one come on base. And oh, we yeah. hadn't heard where we were going yet. Right. Like we hadn't heard what our assignments were. And our commanding officer called everybody who was getting winged. And he's like, we're going to meet at the Waffle House off the base. So all of us, like there was like 20 of us who just get in our wings and uh, Marines and Navy because we trained together. So I was there with a bunch mm-hmm. of Marines. And um, I was supposed to have orders to Japan. I was supposed to be the first female pilot they had ever had in Japan. And uh, he told me, my, at the time, my, I didn't have my call sign yet, but Mitchell was my last name. And he's like, Mitchell, you're not going to Japan. You're going to San Diego. And I was like, okay. Like, you just, at that moment, you didn't care. Yeah. We yeah. kind of knew that things were serious and we were going wherever we were needed. But uh, things changed so fast. In those three days, like, my parents had to be on a list. Mm-hmm. Cars got checked going into the base. You could only have so many people at your winging. Like, it was just amazing how the seriousness changed because before it's like yay the navy i'm gonna see the world and yeah. have a good time and then it was like wait now i really have to like do stuff like i'm gonna have to yeah. learn how to do this and so thank you for sharing that with us yeah. it's always really interesting because especially for one like 9 11 where we all have our own personal we all remember where we, where, where we were what we were doing exactly. so it's always I, I always appreciate kind of hearing other people's stories so thank you for sharing that with us um Moving on from that, again, more kind of into the some personal history, like what's a bit of regional history that people might find interesting about your neck of the woods? It's something I like to ask because we get to talk to people from, oddly enough, we've talked to probably half a dozen people from Missouri, whether it's JD <laughs> yeah. or Mr. Beat or 
a daily bell ringer. Like everybody's from Missouri. I don't know what it is. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, but what's some regional yeah, history? I from- to visit you, Sarah. Like where would you take us to do a walk with history? Oh, that's kind of Portland. Not Portland. Oregon history is is you know it's it's not a lot of military history or anything. It's very um, you know industrialized newspaper. Um, obviously the Oregon Trail. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, um, there is also, you know, like the Pitock Mansion. It was he was oh, the we editor there. for the Oregon for the, yeah for the Oregonian. Um, so like, yeah, the Pitock Mansion's on the hill there, and we on went, the hill, yeah, yeah and it overlooks downtown. I just remember mm-hmm. it had the Gorgeous. great shower that like showers your sides. <laughs> Like, mm-hmm. Your kidneys. I don't remember that. Oh gosh, you remember weird stuff sometimes. <laughs> we. I don't think we were married yet. I don't think we were married. No, yet. we weren't. That's right. Mm-mm. We were. We engaged. were still like we had to put on our best were for we each en- other. <laughs> we were engaged. Yeah. So, so is it really kind of like when it comes to history stuff in your neck of the woods? It really is like Oregon Trail, like Lewis that's and Clark. L- Lewis and it's, Clark. It's really stuff. Lewis and Clark, Oregon Trail. Um, you know the the newspaper industry with the Oregonian out here and the industrialization oh, okay. and, and that type of stuff. It's the evolution of, of the years mm-hmm. of how mm-hmm. everything transforms and, and proceeds and develops. And so it's just kind of that type of history. Yeah. Yeah. I, I bought Oregon. a book. Remember I bought a book when we were out there, one of the early female pioneers, Natasha something. She actually was killed by American Indians out there. So so if there's one thing that I've learned from Sarah's <laughs> post on Instagram is that history fans will buy books almost anywhere that, that you can. <laughs> yes, that is, a, yeah. that is a fact. That is I do a pay fact. attention every once in a while, So I Sarah, bought a so. book in Oregon. <laughs> I think it was like around the Pickhawk Mansion. We were out by, because his mom rented um, a houseboat on that river mm-hmm. over there. And we went to a house there that was one of an older pioneer home. And they had her book mm-hmm. and how she had traveled across on the Oregon Trail with children and just how hardy those women were to do that yeah and to like every, everything you have to do everything you're like you're making bread every day and you're like you know taking care of children and sewing and and um then she actually was massacred in uh, american indian yeah. I, I massacred but they had her letters and her diary and they had turned it into a book and i bought it so mm-hmm. i'm right there for you sarah like my little ode to you. I bought a book when I was out there because I was like, I have to read this. This is so interesting. You know, one one of the last questions that I'm, I think I'm going to start asking folks because a lot of times for folks who are who are fans of history, um, for whatever walk we come from, come from, um, everybody's got that kind of either favorite historical character or favorite history story that if you kind of start getting into to talking to friends family whoever it is you're like hey do i have a cool kind of history tale for you do you kind of have like a, a favorite a favorite person in history that you like to to kind of talk about or tell people about or, or favorite again kind of event or story that's historical that you're like hey guys sit down because i, I i've got a good one for you yes i do um and I have no idea why I am so obsessed with this. And I could just regurgitate the story like over and over again for years. But the sinking of the USS Indianapolis. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sure anybody listening to this is probably like, here goes Sarah again talking about the Indianapolis. Um, I love it. I find that talk about. It. I find that whole, you know, it was one of the biggest, you know, tragedies and mm-hmm. naval tragedies in in military history uh, for the war and. The story of how everything happened and the aftermath of it, you know, they were the ship that helped end the war. They delivered the key components of the atomic bomb, little boy. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I and, think I knew that. Yeah, so you're, you're talking yeah. to someone who doesn't know a lot of history. So, so you feel free to educate me. Feel bad for me. Feel bad <laughs> yeah, for me. So, <laughs> so the USS Indianapolis um, was tasked with a top secret mission to deliver key components to of the atomic bomb, little boy. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were asked for escorts and all this other stuff and captain charles mcveigh was denied many times because navy intelligence said there was no enemies in the water and he was like you know i, I really want an escort and they're like mm, sorry like you know so they had no idea what they were delivering they had no idea what the package was they were uh, all the men of the indie were betting it was like 10,000 rolls of scented gold toilet paper from MacArthur. You know, they had all these bets of what it was. And 
you know, they made they made the delivery super fast. So it was like record speeds that they got. Um, after dropping off the uh, King Components, they stopped at Guam, switched out um, the crew of the Indy, and then they were going out to do trainings um, with uh, Task Force. I am totally, I want to say Task Force 5, but it was with the USS Idaho and like some other ships because they were training for the inevitable invasion of Japan is what they thought they were doing. Okay. On their venture there, um, the Japanese submarine, the I-58, was in the water and uh, set out seven torpedoes. Two of them hit the Indy and it sunk in 12 minutes. Wow. 1,195 men were on board the Indianapolis. 900 went in the water. They were in the water for four days and five nights, um, succumbing to injuries of dehydration, shark attacks, injuries sustained from the explosion, and uh, they finally got got rescued. And the crazy thing is, nobody knew the Indianapolis was missing. Mm-hmm. Nobody knew. Yep. So the Indianapolis Scotty breaks off the board um, because of some check-ins. There's there's a lot of conflicting stories. Like one of the commanding officers was like too drunk and didn't want to be bothered. I don't know if that's one hundred true yeah. but uh nobody knew the indy was missing um and they, they finally got rescued uh after so long and only 316 uh survivors were pulled from the sea and then afterwards uh captain charles mcveigh became the scapegoat mm-hmm. for the sinking of the indianapolis and he got court-martialed and the key witness of his court martial was Hashimoto, the commander of the I-58 submarine, who sunk the Indianapolis. Oh and he was trying to, he got found um, guilty of failing to call a abandoned ship in time and then failing to zigzag in a proper manner, which Hashimoto testified it didn't matter if he was zigzagging. He still would have sunk the Indy. Um, and also, Captain McVeigh was instructed that he didn't have to do zigzag maneuvers unless he felt he needed to do them sure so he ended up getting uh you know found guilty and years after the war he was getting letters from family members of the people who uh lost their loved ones in the sinking and blaming him for the the tragedy uh for not calling abandoned ship and failing to zigzag you know you killed my son i hope you have a merry christmas oh. and um then he ended up uh committing suicide mm-hmm in 1968 i think i believe with his uh service revolver so sarah it was my so again so correct me i figured because of the components they were delivering and it was such a secret mission that that's why when the annapolis was sank they didn't know it was off everyone's radar because they kind of wanted to hide the ship in the first place was that so what it was because they were on a top secret mission mm-hmm. um they weren't technically supposed to like check in or something yeah. if i can remember correctly after they delivered the key components because yeah. then also they were going out to go do training exercises mm-hmm. with other ships and so it wasn't a shocker that the indy didn't check in yeah because of the top secret mission yeah. but there was also um just some miscommunications in regards to that uh that just sadly they lost more people than yeah so you said 900 went into the water 300 were rescued they lost two-thirds of their crew within those three days yeah 1000 yeah 1195 men were aboard the uss indianapolis 900 went in the water 316 survived yeah because when you think about it like even abandoned ship of a 1,100, 900 went in the water. That's a pretty good I mean, estimate of people who got, who got off the ship, yeah. you know, in 12 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty yeah. good. Yeah. Well, the, the ones who, the, the ones who didn't make it off the ship, they, uh, so they were part of the explosion. Yeah. Of, yeah. So, of, you I know, they passed from the explosion of the, the ship. Captain. And, yeah. Yeah. That's he's such a scapegoat. Yeah. He was like, um, and if you can think about 12 minutes of when you get, hit by the second torpedo and the ship is completely underwater like that's that's not a lot of time no that's actually really fast Mm -hmm. yeah sorry jen i totally interrupted you no no you're right no sarah so (laughs) you know i'm seeing this as like really he had most of the crew in the water it was the rescue Mm -hmm. that took forever so the the responsibility is not the captains at that point yeah you know the responsibility is who's in charge of watching the battle group 
you know, and yeah. I, he was used as a scapegoat. What a terrible. It, it, was he and exonerated? He, he did, Wasn't he, he exonerated later? He was. He was exonerated. So a 13 year old kid named Hunter Scott mm-hmm. um, was doing his history project and he did it on the USS Indianapolis. This was back in 1999, I think it was. And he, this, Hunter went like deep for being yeah. an eighth grader. He, he interviewed so many um, survivors. He went in and got uh, records, like 800 records. He started mm-hmm. reading and he's like, oh my gosh, Captain McVeigh is not guilty. Mm-hmm. He got yeah. screwed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so um, he brought it to his, uh, his, uh, I can't remember the congressman's name, but he, he brought it to light. Huh. And then finally, you know, after uh, putting everything into motion, uh, Bill Clinton signed uh, his exoneration in oh, 2001. Cool. And so, awesome. so he was, he is exonerated, but yeah. you know, sadly it was after his passing. And then also the survivors of the Indy, they had been for years trying to get him exonerated because none of them blamed him for what happened. Yeah. And so it was uh, a long time coming, but I'm happy that he got exonerated and all because of a 13 a year old eighth grader doing a history project. I love it. <laughs> a historian digging deeper. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Well, well, Sarah, thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. Um, I have a feeling that we could continue to talk for quite a while because <laughs> this, the, the last 50 minutes actually went really, really quickly. So, um, so to prevent us, us from kind of bantering on for too, too long, maybe we'll, we'll have to have you back on again in the future. And for those listening to the podcast and for those watching the live stream, where can, can folks find you online? Where's the best place? So my main focus is Instagram. Uh, my handle is the history chick 1941. I am also on TikTok, but it, I post the same stuff on Instagram that I do on TikTok. And then YouTube, I'm also on YouTube. That is where I upload all of my history behind the page videos yep. uh, after the interviews. So um, same hand, all handles are the same. So it's the history chick 1941. Awesome. Well, yeah. And I'm going to give a little plug for Sarah. She interviews that guy from Band of Brothers that we love in Orville. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Scott Grimes. Scott yeah. Grimes. She interviews him. Yeah. That, was, that cool. was a great interview. Yeah. I watched it. I loved it. So if you're interested in watching her interview with him, check out The History Chick on YouTube. Yeah. So so again, for those listening, go go check out Sarah uh, in The History Chick. We'll definitely link her, her social media links um, in the show notes of this episode. And thank you again for listening to the Talk With History podcast. We encourage listeners to head to the link in the show notes. Subscribe to Talk With History for free on your platform of choice. And don't forget to share this with your fellow history fans out there because we rely on you, our community, to grow. We appreciate you all every day. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you.